This is Gary Atensu with CNTV, and today we're in Oklahoma. I am here with Center for Conscious Expansion. Since 2010, he's been helping you discover and handle the actual source of addiction and break free from its grip. I am joined here with the author, speaker, coach. Thanks so much for joining us here today, Alan. My pleasure. Glad to be here, Gary. Thank you. I'm going to start off a little bit about yourself. You're formally educated at Western State College of Law. With a law degree in hand, you spend years in the business world making multi-million dollar real estate deals. But your true passion really has led you across the globe, studying the human spirit from the world's greatest leaders and really the common man. Share with us how seeking answers has kind of led you here today. Well, you know, uh, as I kind of began my journey, I didn't really have much of a guidance on kind of how I was meandering through the world. And so one of, one of the things that I noticed is I was broke before I was a lawyer and I was just kind of hunting around and looking around for what I wanted to, what I wanted to do. So I, I found myself hustling. So I was broke with no real vocation and then I became a lawyer and then I became wealthy. But on both of those occasions, I just, there was an emptiness or there was a missingness that was there, a void, I guess, if you will. And I didn't know that if everybody else was feeling this void, maybe it was kind of part of the human experience, but I just knew that it was something that none of my colleagues didn't want to, they just didn't really talk, want to talk too much about it. <laughs> I mean, your pursuit in understanding the human spirit has led you to many corners of the world. Centuries ago, ancient thinkers taught us to know thyself. Are those words still relevant today, would you say? Yeah, they, they, they are. They're extremely, they're extremely powerful. And whether it's somebody I'm dealing with with an addiction or somebody that's just a lay person off the streets, it's what's missing is what is that self, that thyself part that was never identified. And so, you know, I just was asked the other day, why am I dealing with or working with people with addictions? And Quite frankly, it's because those people are just more ripe or more receptive to this conversation about who thyself is. I mean, in your quest, you soon realized and understood that answers would not only come from the world's greatest spiritual leaders that you met and you studied, but rather from who, would you say? You know, just, um, you know, I spent some time working uh, in a couple different maximum security prisons and one of the things that I noticed that there were some really wonderful, great human beings that had just maybe made a couple choices where they had kind of gotten off their path uh, through their life, but were extremely intelligent, but were wearing this kind of, I don't know, maybe you want to call it a social label of being an inmate or being a criminal or being whatever it is, but it wasn't really who they are. I began to notice that there was this social identity where people were looking at each other as, what do you do for a living and how much do you have? And then there was there was something underneath it that was a little more authentic or a little more genuine that I was starting to perceive. So that was where a big transition for me kind of opened up where I knew that we were more than our jobs. <laughs> yes, very much so. I mean, your experiences literally on the front lines of life's battles have led you with uh, Tibetan monks all the way to, like you say, volunteering in a maximum security prison. Do you find answers actually dwelling among humanity, would you say? I, I do. And one of the things that's extremely powerful about, uh, you know, kind of learning on these kind of kind of internal, external duality kind of framework, we find ourselves in this world is none of the answers or none of the solutions are what we'll call out there. And until one starts to embark on that journey of coming back within themselves, are they really able to make some real strong headway? And what I've noticed is as you begin to travel around the world and see these different c categories of people in different facets or different religions, there's one or two things that are underneath all of them. And one of them fundamentally, primarily, which is the core of the work that I do is we want to feel good and we want to be happy. And so whatever you do to deny that or negate that until you come to grips with the fact that what you want primarily as a human being is to feel good, it's a little bit bumpy out there. Yes, definitely so. I mean... Not only listening to the words of the living, but looking into the eyes of the dying. What have these experiences taught you about how men have risen above, really above anything that they've created? Yeah, that's really good. I spent um, I spent quite a few years, maybe seven or eight years, working with the hospice movement, 
And uh, I got involved because the, my teacher at the time, I started telling him that I was, I was feeling a bunch of fear of my own mortality. And he's the one who got me and kind of nudged me into the hospice movement. And one of the things that I noticed is when people are coming up upon this big mystery of this transitioning out of their physical form, the stakes are pretty high and they're not really up for a lot of nonsense chatter and stuff. They want to start asking some real questions. And I began to notice is what, what is it for us as human beings that has us postpone that, has us be distracted from that giant great mystery. And, and what I noticed is that there's a real timing in the method of the unfolding of my life, of your life. There isn't a rightness. There isn't a wrongness. The fact that one person is reaching more interestingly in, the, in this area doesn't make that better than or worse than. There's just an evolution and there's a real timing and an allowance in it. I mean, in hospice, you experience people that weren't into the fluff talk, yet that's kind of been you your whole entire life as you've, you've gone through this. I mean, you've really always uh, dug deep. Your focus of expertise is on addiction. How did that come to be? Well, as I begin to notice that there was a kind of a, I started noticing my experience of my my own my own world, my own universe, and in that world, there was no matter what I achieved, or whatever attributes or whatever things I accomplished, I noticed there was always an emptiness, there was always a missingness or an, or a void, and I was uh, quite frankly a little bit, I was a little pissed off that how is it that I can't distract myself with my career and just become a lawyer and successful and have a couple summer homes around the world and then just die with my family surrounded me talking about my accolades right it was, <laughs> that was kind of what i was kind of hoping i could settle for but it just really wasn't in the cards and what i began to realize is that void that was there whether it was me drinking or whether it was me chasing around partying or whatever it didn't matter what it was eating eating was the last one that i dropped off but it was on one of one or more different facets. It was something that I was seeking to get some relief. I was getting wanting to get some relief. So my mind was so extremely powerful and there was so much resistance in my mind that what I began to notice is if I just had a couple cocktails, I could take the edge off. Well, two turned into five, turned into 15, turned into like uh, if I was invited somewhere, one of the prerequisites is there needed to be some alcohol there. Right, it wasn't. It wasn't about living my life anymore. It turned into a game of just getting relief, and I didn't know at the time is that I was seeking relief from from mental resistance. And so, as I began to do and inscribe that work on myself, I transitioned from taking an edge off with some alcohol to transitioning to taking the edge off through meditation. And as I evolved and became aware of my, it was really just evolving and becoming aware of my condition and noticing. There's got to be another way here. And I think that fundamental question for me, which is what I, I notice in other people that end up being attracted into working with me, is at some point the being asked that question, like, this can't be all there is because this is a pretty dark tunnel and it's getting darker. There must be another way. There must be another way. I mean, with the mind and experience of a litigation attorney, you have razor sharp insight to see through the blind spots and get to the source, really, of the problem, to answer the question of why we do what we do. Would you say that is kind of what you're known for? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I noticed that there was a lot of people who had stopped drinking or they stopped drugs or they stopped the pornography or they stopped the gambling, but that wasn't the behavior, wasn't the problem. There was something underlying that was much deeper. There was a sense of a, a missingness or this you know, as I say, people always say, like, you're just filling the void with the addictive behavior, but no one ever told them what the void was. And as I began to start to understand this connectedness with myself and started understanding my mental resistance and how what I was doing, it wasn't that I wanted to drink so much and have my life start to fall apart. It's that I wanted relief. I wanted to not be in so much pain. And then as I begin to notice, just stopping the behavior is not the solution. It may put them in a little better place, but at cer certain times, it's it's almost uh, it's like winning the booby prize. You're not drinking, but that problem didn't get handled. It didn't get handled. So one of the things that I've noticed with people is people want to feel good and they want to be happy. And if they can't figure that out by on their own on getting connected to themselves, they're going to find a way with some substance or some behavior because 
like it or not, it's that doesn't stand still. That's getting worse or it's getting better, one of the two. Yeah, absolutely. So we're either improving. Uh, we're never just plateauing. It's one or the other. That's the way it is. You have coached a, a thousand people to learn to see patterns really in their thinking. Can these patterns be disrupted and changed so they no longer hurt us, but maybe instead empower us? Yeah. So it's really, that's a beautiful question. And one of the things that I've noticed in myself and others that I work with is this game of life for a human being in a body in this physical plane of existence really comes down to momentum. As one begins to start creating this emotional and mental momentum, you know, thoughts followed up by feelings, things can start to feel really, really good for people and things can begin to manifest in their universe. But if you're on that dark track and you're not understanding about this momentum and these thoughts kind of gathering momentum and mass, what happens is it goes from wanting to feel good to not wanting to feel bad anymore. And when you become aware of this or somebody gives you the gift of showing this to you and, and you're able to receive it, well, a freight train doesn't stop immediately and go the other direction. It's a slowing down of the momentum and then a transition of moving it in the other direction. So, you know, people ask, how long is this going to take? And I tell them, it takes as long as it takes for that momentum to slow down and turn it around and go another direction. That's how long. Yep, you've got to change that uh, years and years of momentum and then transition that. I mean, with your guidance, your clients really kind of deep dive. I mean, revealing hidden issues that help them discover the source of their addiction. Is this new awareness provide hope for many of them? And is that kind of exciting to witness that momentum change? It's, uh, it's extremely fulfilling for me. And one of the things that's been really empowering for me is understanding and honoring that not everybody's ready to make that transition. And that's, that's absolutely fine. But what I, what I really take the most joy in in life, what really lights me up is when working with somebody who can become aware that this emotional momentum and that all their thoughts have been creating their reality for them. And then when they can begin to begin a meditation practice and then not jump from bad thoughts to good thoughts, but jump from bad thoughts to neutral thoughts and become aware of the fact that through their meditation practice, they're actually causing this neutralization of these negative thoughts. When a person gets there and then starts to know that they're the one causing how they're feeling, they're really on their way. And that's a real, that's a real joyful, joyful experience. And, you know, I get, I get text messages and voicemail messages on my phone sometimes that, you know, just, just the precious nectar of life for me. Very cool to be able to experience those wins for others and share in that. I mean, once you're able to see the source, you're then able to apply the correct technology to really actually free the person up. Do you have multiple ways to help clients? I mean, this isn't a one size or a one solution fits all, I would imagine. So I have a concept in my technology that I work from. The concept is understanding plus application yields experience. So everybody has a certain understanding of their condition to some degree or another. And they're applying what they know to some degree or another, and that's yielding whatever experience they're having of being alive, that's the quality of that being alive. So sometimes when I meet people, they live in a dualistic framework. Is this right? Is this wrong? Is this good or this bad? And I really get them really more connected to like, there isn't really anything good or bad about what you're doing, but it's yielding a certain quality of an experience of being alive, right? So one of the things I shift out of this paradigm is going from this mental concept of being right and being good and being bad and this dualistic framework to how does that feel? And so if you ask me if there's something that's a that's a, a commonality of all of it, I, I'm really, really aligned with the Dalai Lama who says he, when he comes out to speak, he always says, you know, before we met, I knew we had something in common. Both of us desire to feel good. So the the, the mystery for me was, number one, is when I was a little boy, that was all I was connected to was feeling good. And it was natural for me to feel that way. And I knew that that's how I was supposed to feel. But somehow through my evolution, I got distracted from that. And how I felt became way down the pole. And the further that lost its priority, the worse my experience of being alive got. So if there was something that's anchored for everyone, it's you got to start paying attention and make it a priority on how you feel because... If you don't, it's going to be bumpy. That's just the way it, it's the way it works here in these bodies. 
I like how you said the lower you put that down, it's almost like where that void came from. I mean, that is really where it comes from. Alan, you have been trained by top experts in the world. So now with an unbending commitment, an extremely high care factor, with an unmatched ability to listen and to hear what's at issue for your clients, is this rewarding work for you? Yeah, it 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 really it really is, and and I and I'll share something with you about about the statement that you just made that I learned was that you know learning more about the expansion of myself and my own consciousness is really the gift because there isn't anything that I teach that has people have like oh I have a degree from the Con Center for Conscious Expansion there's like there's no there's no like that this is a conversation and it's an ongoing expansion there is no getting there it's continually happening and. One of the biggest, most subtle things that happens with people when I'm starting to work with them is just having a conversation about them learning how to care for themselves and be kind to themselves. And I don't normally do it on the first call. I normally wait until the second call, and it normally goes a little bit like this. Hey, you know, I just want to let you know we've been talking now for a couple hours, and I'd like you to know that I get the feeling that if I was treating you half as rough as you were treating yourself, you'd probably call the cops on me. And that kind of hits people and it's kind of light and kind of clever and kind of fun, but it snaps into this recognition of like, wow, I really am rough on myself. And normally, normally as that conversation gets received, they then can start to see the reciprocating, how that kind of works, where they're treating other people the way they're treating themselves. And there's really something that's not feeling really good about that. And starting to treat oneself better and being more kind to oneself it's such an underrated, overlooked phenomena and a, and a distinction that really makes a shift immediately in working with somebody. That is great. I'm glad you touched on a little bit kind of the, the, the title of this expansion, which makes a lot of sense. Viewers, let's take a look at the bottom of the screen right there. What you're going to see is this website. On the website, you can learn more about his vast experience. I mean, read great testimonials as others have learned from him that before any transformation can occur, you must discover the right way, the right why for the source of the problem. So reach out today. That is Center for Conscious Expansion, your path to freedom and a step towards a brighter and healthier future. This is Gary Atencio with CNTV. And if you don't know, now you know. 